of Arkham, the hills rise wild, and there are valleys with deep woods that no axe has ever cut. There are dark, narrow glens where the trees slope fantastically, and where thin brooklets trickle without ever having caught the glint of sunlight. On the gentler slopes there are farms, ancient and rocky, with squat, moss-coated cottages brooding eternally over old New England secrets in the lee of great ledges. But these are all vacant now, the wide chimneys crumbling and the shingled sides bulging perilously beneath low, gambrel roofs. The old folk have gone away, and foreigners do not like to live there. French Canadians have tried it, Italians have tried it, and the Poles have come and departed. It is not because of anything that can be seen or heard or handled, but because of something that is imagined. The place is not good for imagination, and does not bring restful dreams at night. It must be this which keeps the foreigners away, for old Ami Pierce has never told them of anything he recalls from the strange days. Ami, whose head has been a little queer for years, is the only one who still remains, or who ever talks of the strange days. And he dares to do this because his house is so near the open fields and the traveled roads around Arkham. There was once a road over the hills and through the valleys that ran straight where the blasted heath is now. But people ceased to use it, and a new road was laid curving far toward the south. Traces of the old one can still be found, even when half the hollows are flooded for the new reservoir. Then the dark woods will be cut down, and the blasted heath will slumber far below blue waters, whose surface will mirror the sky and ripple in the sun. And the secrets of the strange days will be one with the deep's secrets, one with the hidden lore of old ocean, and all the mystery of primal earth. When I went into the hills and vales to survey for the new reservoir, they told me the place was evil. They told me this in Arkham, and because that is a very old town full of witch legends, I thought the evil must be something which grandmas had whispered to children through centuries. The name Blasted Heath seemed to me very odd and theatrical, and I wondered how it had come into the folklore of a Puritan people. Then I saw that dark westward tangle of glens and slopes for myself, and ceased to wonder at anything besides its own elder mystery. It was morning when I saw it, but shadow lurked always there. The trees grew too thickly, and their trunks were too big for any healthy New England wood. There was too much silence in the dim alleys between them, and the floor was too soft with the dank moss and mattings of infinite years of decay. In the open spaces, mostly along the line of the old road, there were little hillside farms, sometimes with all the buildings standing, sometimes with only one or two, and sometimes with only a lone chimney or fast-filling cellar. Weeds and briars reigned, and furtive wild things rustled in the undergrowth. Upon everything was a haze of restlessness and oppression, a touch of the unreal and the grotesque, as if some vital element of perspective or chiaroscuro were awry. I did not wonder that the foreigners would not stay, for this was no region to sleep in. It was too much like a landscape of Salvatore Rosa, too much like some forbidden woodcut in a tale of terror. But even all this was not so bad as the blasted heath. I knew it the moment I came upon it at the bottom of a spacious valley, for no other name could fit such a thing or any other thing fit such a name. It was as if the poet had coined the phrase from having seen this one particular region. It must, I thought, as I viewed it, be the outcome of a fire. But why had nothing new ever grown over those five acres of gray desolation 
that sprawled open to the sky like a great spot eaten by acid in the woods and fields. It lay largely to the north of the ancient road line, but encroached a little on the other side. I felt an odd reluctance about approaching, and did so at last only because my business took me through and past it. There was no vegetation of any kind on that broad expanse, but only a fine gray dust or ash, which no wind seemed ever to blow about. The trees near it were sickly and stunted, and many dead trunks stood or lay rotting at the rim. As I walked hurriedly by, I saw the tumbled bricks and stones of an old chimney and cellar on my right, and the yawning black maw of an abandoned well whose stagnant vapors played strange tricks with the hues of the sunlight. Even the long dark woodland climb beyond seemed welcome in contrast, and I marveled no more at the frightened whispers of Arkham people. There had been no house or ruin near. Even in the old days, the place must have been lonely and remote. And at twilight, dreading to repass that ominous spot, I walked circuitously back to the town by the curving road on the south. I vaguely wished some clouds would gather for an odd timidity about the deep sky. The voids above had crept into my soul. In the evening, I asked old people in Arkham about the blasted heath and what was meant by that phrase, strange days, which so many evasively muttered. I could not, however, get any good answers, except that all the mystery was much more recent than I had dreamed. It was not a matter of old legendary at all, but something within the lifetime of those who spoke. It had happened in the 80s, and a family had disappeared or was killed. Speakers would not be exact. And because they all told me to pay no attention to old Amy Pierce's crazy tales, I sought him out the next morning, having heard that he lived alone in the ancient tottering cottage where the trees first begin to get very thick. It was a fearsomely ancient place, and had begun to exude the faint miasmal odor which clings about houses that have stood too long. Only with persistent knocking could I rouse the aged man, and when he shuffled timidly to the door, I could tell he was not glad to see me. He was not so feeble as I had expected, but his eyes drooped in a curious way, and his unkempt clothing and white beard made him seem very worn and dismal. Not knowing just how he could best be launched on his tales, I feigned a matter of business, told him of my surveying, and asked vague questions about the district. He was far brighter and more educated than I had been led to think, and before I knew it had grasped quite as much of the subject as any man I had talked with in Arkham. He was not like other rustics I had known in the sections where reservoirs were to be. From him, there were no protests at the miles of old wood and farmland to be blotted out, though perhaps there would have been had not his home lain outside the bounds of the future lake. Relief was all that he showed, relief at the doom of the dark ancient valleys through which he had roamed all his life. They were better under water now, better under water since the strange days. And with this opening, his husky voice sank low, while his body leaned forward and his right forefinger began to point shakily and impressively. It was then that I heard the story. And as the rambling voice scraped and whispered on, I shivered again and again, despite the summer day. Often I had to recall the speaker from ramblings, piece out scientific points which he knew only by a fading parrot memory of professors' talk, or bridge over gaps where his sense of logic and continuity broke down. When he was done, I did not wonder that his mind had snapped a trifle, or that the folk of Arkham would not speak much of the blasted heath. 
I hurried back before sunset to my hotel, unwilling to have the stars come out above me in the open, and the next day returned to Boston to give up my position. I could not go into that dim chaos of old forest and slope again, or face another time that gray blasted heath where the black well yawned deep beside the tumbled bricks and stones. The reservoir will soon be built now, and all those elder secrets will be safe forever under watery fathoms. But even then, I do not believe I would like to visit that country by night, at least not when the sinister stars are out, and nothing could bribe me to drink the new city water of Arkham. It all began, old Amy said, with the meteorite. Before that time, there had been no wild legends at all since the witch trials, and even then these western woods were not feared half so much as the small island in the Miskatonic, where the devil held court beside a curious stone altar older than the Indians. These were not haunted woods, and their fantastic dusk was never terrible till the strange days. Then there had come that white, noontide cloud, that string of explosions in the air, and that pillar of smoke from the valley far in the wood. And by night all Arkham had heard of the great rock that fell out of the sky and bedded itself in the ground beside the well at the Nahum Gardner place. That was the house which had stood where the blasted heath was to come. The trim, white Nahum Gardner house amidst its fertile gardens and orchards. Nahum had come to town to tell people about the stone and dropped in at Amy Pierce's on the way. Amy was 40 then, and all the queer things were fixed very strongly in his mind. He and his wife had gone with the three professors from Miskatonic University, who hastened out the next morning to see the weird visitor from unknown stellar space and had wondered why Nahum had called it so large the day before. It had shrunk, Nahum said as he pointed out the big brownish mound above the ripped earth and charred grass near the archaic well sweep in his front yard. But the wise men answered that stones do not shrink. Its heat lingered persistently, and Nahum declared it had glowed faintly in the night. The professors tried it with a geologist's hammer and found it was oddly soft. It was, in truth, so soft as to be almost plastic, and they gouged rather than chipped a specimen to take back to the college for testing. They took it in an old pail borrowed from Nahum's kitchen, for even the small piece refused to grow cool. On the trip back, they stopped at Amy's to rest and seemed thoughtful when Mrs. Pierce remarked that the fragment was growing smaller and burning the bottom of the pail. Truly it was not large, but perhaps they had taken less than they thought. 